Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. Just peachy. Peachy. I like it. I like it. Welcome to worship this morning. Uh, good to see each and every one of you here. Um, anyone thinking this morning that the trees look beautiful? Winter or not, right? Uh, we're going to give thanks for the day that God has created for us, and uh, we're going to honor that Sabbath by coming together in worship today as well. Uh, a couple announcements. Um, they are, of course, printed for you on the back of the bulletin. Today, after the worship service, we'll be uh, taking down the Christmas decorations. Uh, if you're able to stay in hope with that, there's also a little light lunch available to you uh, if you'd like some time of fellowship as well. Um, any more to say about that, Rhonda? Just hang out and help, right? Hang out and help. Um, with that announcement, I will say also, again, uh, we're so thankful for those of you who purchased a poinsettia and uh, shared that with us during the Christmas season to decorate our chancel area up here. Uh, those plants, these plants here, are available for you to take home uh, anytime after today's service. Uh, if you purchased one and, and don't wish to take it home with you, if you're saying you're not going to keep it alive till next year and bring it back, uh, we understand, but um, you know, if, if they are to be collected and, and put in the foyer or the memorial room uh, and they are not taken home, then we'll be uh, willing to share those with those who might like them. So if, if you're not interested in taking it home, that's, that's okay, but maybe indicate that to us so we know we can share that with someone else who would like it. Um, meals on Wheels, um, our church will be helping deliver those meals in February, so if you want to sign up for that, there's a sign-up sheet out at the Welcome Center. Uh, are there any other announcements for the good of the people this morning? I know Scott's in the back with a microphone ready to come to you if you have something you want to say. No takers. Anybody? Oh, I oh, knew it. Joyce? Are this for Joyce too? Well, you can share it and I'll share it with you. If you like. Are you going to talk about an anniversary, Marilyn? Yes. 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 Carl and Sally will be celebrating their 68th wedding anniversary tomorrow. Uh, unfortunately, Sally is not here with us today, but Carl asked that maybe we announce that, and, and of course, we're going to rejoice with you in that 68 years. So, yes. <laughs> Any others, announcements for the good of the people? Thank you for those who helped with the cookie project this year. Yes. Um, I would like to have prayers and wishes for my daughter. She's traveled to Ecuador and she'll be there till the 16th with a group of people. Six people, I guess. Okay. I just would like to uh, remind people that in February, it is our turn to do Meals on Wheels. So um, if you would like to help with that project, there is a sign-up sheet in the uh, Welcome Center. Thanks. Any others? All right, would you center your hearts as we prepare for worship this morning?
gather together today to worship the one who created us, the one who calls us, the one who equips us, the one who loves us without end. With joyful hearts, let us worship God. Would you stand and sing your praises together this morning? Let's, let's rise and sing together. If you've been here before, if you know me, um, you've probably heard me preach a sermon or two that had something to do with sheep. Um, don't give me oh. um, 
If, if you know my husband and I, we've, we've got sheep, we've got hogs, we've got a few calves from time to time. Uh, one animal that does not reside on my property uh, would be a horse. So where are my horse people? All right, you're up today. I'm gonna count on your expertise. Uh, we'll pull the crowd a little bit and we'll see if, if maybe we need your assistance and your knowledge. How many of you know what a bridle is? Not a bridal party, a bridle for a horse, right? You know the difference between a bridle, a bit, a harness, the reins? Good. Um, what is a bridle for? I'm interested in your response. Holds the bit, the bit controls the horse. Steers, right? Communication. Uh, offers a little guidance, right? Um, how many of you have ridden a horse? So you know that there's some value in being able to communicate, right? To, to offer some guidance or some, some steering, if you will. And I thought, well, what if people aren't familiar with horses? How, what else can I put out there as an example? How many of you have a dog? Probably more of you are familiar with horses. Uh, you put a leash on your dog? Sometimes. What's it for? <laughs> Communication? So they don't run away, some control. How many of you, let's, let's take it a little farther. How many of you have kids? <laughs> With or without the leash. I, I, before I crack the joke, I was gonna ask, anybody use the child safety harnesses that are available these days? Yes. Right? Yes. Um, I, I will say that Trevin and I, a time or two, looked at, at folks that had their kids, I'm just gonna say, on a leash, and just kind of thought, wow, that's, you know. Um, but the intention was to keep that child safe, right? To keep that child near. And uh, whether we're talking about a bridle or a leash or a <coughs> child safety harness, if you will, um, you know, while there can be, it can be seen as a restraint, certainly, um, but it's a tool. Um, and when I think of a bridal, I, I had a, a friend when I was growing up, very, when I was very little, her name was Samantha, and she had a horse. And, and uh, when they first got that horse, it, it did not want to be ridden, did not want to be groomed, did not want to be touched, really. And through uh, their, their work and, and uh, whether you say breaking the horse, which I don't know if we use that term, but um, they established a point where it then became very docile and was eager to be ridden by my friend Samantha. And so much so that at one point, she could just climb on it. No saddle, no bridle, no reins, no nothing. And the horse knew the route of where they would go. And uh, it was a relationship builder for them. Um, some of you have, have seen my, I'll call her a dog now, She's, she acts like a puppy, but dog Sadie here with me. I, I do bring the leash when we come into town. Um, she prefers to carry it herself, but um, you know, when she was a puppy, that was very much a tool for me to keep her close, to keep her safe, and to keep her under control. At this point, she knows when we put the leash on, she's supposed to walk beside me, so I don't have to worry too much about that. It's another time where I'm thinking, you know, I don't need it so much anymore. She's able to be unleashed. She's been transformed a bit. I can set her free. The, the word unbridled uh, is often used to describe people's emotions or actions. And it can be seen as, as either a good thing or a bad thing, right? If, if I were to say, um, you know, Kate has unbridled spending habits. You're gonna say, boy, she's probably got a lot of debt, right? We need to have a talk. That's not so good. But if I were to say, Tim Hemphill goes about his work with unbridled enthusiasm, you're thinking he's a guy that's getting it done, right? It can be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, what we're gonna be talking about for the next couple weeks, I think is a good thing, unbridled faith. I want to set you free. I, I want to unleash this church. And I think in 2023, uh, for
For some of us, maybe we need to be unbridled. We need to cut the leash. And I know that when we start a new year, our tendency is to focus on ourselves. We do a lot of reflection about where we've been, where we want to go. Um, maybe we need to be set free from that. Not focus so much on ourselves, but focus on the needs of people around us. Uh, there are all kinds of folks that are making New Year's resolutions, right? If you've been watching television at all, have you seen the commercials for Nutrisystem and Weight Watchers and 24-7 Fitness and all of those? Um, it's, it's time for New Year's resolutions. I, I certainly uh, thought about that for a moment, thinking, you know, people are focusing on, on creating new habits for themselves, and it's easy to think, you know, let's do a sermon series then that helps people with those habits. Maybe people are saying, I'm going to commit to reading the Bible in a year. We could focus on those new habits. Well, um, I am a self-professed statistics junkie. Our statistics in the past have shown us that New Year's resolutions are typically abandoned by February. Our new statistic, I'm lucky if you held on to that uh, New Year's resolution until January 12th. Um, that's our, our latest data that we have, is most people that commit to a big life change on the first of the year, they're done with that in 12 days. So I thought, you know what, maybe we need to be talking about something else. And as we begin this new year, I want to take the attention off of ourselves. We're putting the attention on the world around us because I do believe that what God wants us to do is unleash this church for his purpose in this new year. Uh, when we're talking about the disciples, there came a point for them where they needed to be unbridled. Right? They, were, they had been traveling with Jesus, they had followed him, they were used to having Jesus around them, he was always with them, leading them and guiding them. And then Jesus began to prepare them for what life was going to be like when he went to heaven. And he says, you know what, you're still on this mission. Uh, they were to go out to the whole world, but Jesus wasn't going to be with them physically in person any longer. And in Matthew 28, he gives them this unbridled commission Perhaps you're familiar. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. So they're unbridled. They're unleashed. Uh, they are sent out to change the world. The book of Acts uh, records for us uh, some of these unbridled stories of how the early church turned the world upside down. So that's where we're going to be hanging out for the next few weeks in this sermon series. Uh, if you've never read the book of Acts, I would encourage you to do that this month. If you have read it before, I would encourage you to refresh your memory and maybe study, dig into it a little deeper uh, throughout this series. I want to make sure and start, um, again, as we're looking at the book of Acts, something that I want to point out about this small group of Jesus followers that we see, um, just kind of right out of, out of the gate. The early church indeed changed the world, but not because uh, they were a, a handful of highly educated, uh, politically powerful, ultra wealthy influencers uh, that, that made that happen. That is not the story of the church. Uh, the story of the church would be about a, a united group of everyday, ordinary people coming together for something bigger than themselves. Ordinary people being used by God in extraordinary ways. And I think that here at Faith, uh, in 2023, we have an opportunity to live that out in so many ways. If we can come together and unleash the full force of the church and just radically love people, then the gospel will advance. And I think that's what all of us want, right? That's where you say yes. <laughs> that's what all of us want. I think deep down, we, we want to be difference makers. We're, we're not always sure what we can do, but we want to do something. Like, we don't want to just be space takers and time wasters. We want to be difference makers. We don't always know what our role is or what part we have to play, but we don't want to sit on the sidelines or watch from the stands. We want to be in the game. We're just not sure what that looks like. So I want you to have unbridled faith. I want you to be unleashed for all that God can do through you. I want us 
to make a difference. And for us to really embrace that, uh, one of the shifts that needs to take place is for us to understand what the Bible calls the priesthood of all believers. Uh, the biblical teaching that the mission of the church is not just for pastors, it's not just for missionaries, it's not just your evangelism team, it's all of us. We're all part of the priesthood, we're all part of the mission that God has given us. Um, it's not going to work, friends, if a majority of the church says, you know what, the church exists for me and for my entertainment and so that I can receive. It's not going to work. To be the church that God has called us to be, it means that this year you're, you're going to not just attend, but you're going to engage. And if uh, you're watching us online, it means this year you're not going to just watch online, you can still engage in the life of church, and I, and I will be a part of helping find new opportunities to do that. It means that your mentality is not receive, it's give. It's the priesthood of all believers. It means that you're not going to just sit, you have come to serve. So we are talking about being unbridled or unleashed because I think the restraint that holds a lot of us back in the church is that we, we feel unqualified. Um, we start to do some math in our heads and we add up our inadequacies and we multiply that by our mistakes and we look around at the problems of the world and we come to the conclusion that, you know what, we're, I'm not the answer. Like, I, I want somebody to have the answer, but it's, it's not me. Um, it's not that we're unwilling, it's just that we don't feel qualified. And maybe that's um, because you think you have the wrong pedigree. You, you didn't grow up studying God's word or going to church or praying together as a family so you didn't, don't feel like you know how to do that. You feel like you're kind of disqualified from the beginning. Or maybe you feel like you've got the wrong degree. Um, you didn't go to seminary. You didn't go to a Bible college. You haven't really studied the Bible a lot. You don't know the answers to some of the basic questions. You've spent more time in your life maybe running from Jesus than pursuing Jesus. So in your mind, you're like, you know what? I want to make a difference, um, but it's probably best to leave that to someone else, maybe a professional. Like, we have a pastor for that, right? <laughs> or maybe you feel like you've got the wrong resume. Uh, you can't really point to any moment in your life where you made a significant spiritual impact in the life of someone else. Like, if you were filling out a resume to be a difference maker in the kingdom of God, you're not sure what you would write down. You just don't feel qualified for the job. But here's what we're going to see as we study through the book of Acts in the beginning of the church, and it's really what we see throughout all of Scripture. God loves to transform and unleash the unqualified. He loves to demonstrate his power in our weakness. He loves to take the very thing that you feel most disqualifies you and use that for his good, for his glory, to accomplish his purpose. It's maybe the one thing that everyone in scripture who's ever been used by God in an extraordinary way has in common. is that they all feel ordinary. They all feel unqualified. And two of the people here, as we begin looking at some of these narratives in the book of Acts, uh, two of these people I'm going to point out to you would be Peter and John. <laughs> who become prominent leaders in growing the early church. Uh, maybe you are familiar with Peter and John, the disciples, maybe not so much, um, but I'm going to start by taking a look at them today and, and saying, yes, they started the church and started growing the church, but Peter and John, they, they didn't apply for that job to lead the church. You understand? They, they didn't fill out an application and say, I think this is the job for me. Uh, they didn't ace a big rabbi exam. They didn't uh, have a, an impressive resume. They didn't nail the interview. They didn't seem qualified. In fact, Peter and John, it's easier to make a case that they're unqualified, that they are disqualified from this pool. Uh, Peter, he was kind of impulsive, to put it mildly. He had a knack for saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. 
And yet what you find with Peter is that he, in some ways, is the primary spokesperson for the church. If you look at his life leading up to that, though, it doesn't seem like there's anything that would qualify him for that. And then there's John. John, before he became a follower of Jesus, he was known for having a short temper. He was known for having anger issues, uh, so much so that they had a nickname for him, the Son of Thunder. Uh, He and his brother James were known as the Sons of Thunder, if you're familiar with that scripture. Um, Anybody know somebody that you call the Son of Thunder? Doesn't sound like somebody who graduated at the top of their seminary class, does it? Sounds like the guy that rides into town on his Harley with a face tattoo of him riding in on his Harley, right? That's the son of thunder. And yet you see John become more and more about love. And it takes a while. He starts off with some major anger management issues to overcome, but he makes that decision to follow Jesus And by the time you get to the books of 1st and 2nd and 3rd John in the New Testament, the whole theme of that is love. God's love for us and our love for one another. And it's coming from the Son of Thunder. If you're going through his resume, if you're looking at his application and where he's been and what's brought him to this point, you're like, this is not going to work. But God transformed that. And unleashed him. So I want to look at a story as we dig into the book of Acts where we find that Peter and John are are standing trial. Um, They've been speaking about Jesus. and uh, They're they're standing before the ruling council of religious leaders. And and here's what those leaders, uh, that ruling council, realize about Peter and John. They realize that they are not educated rabbis. They are not known prophets. They were unschooled, ordinary men. They're not qualified. Uh, And the word ordinary comes from the Greek word uh, idiotos, which is where we get the word idiot. Um, It didn't have the same kind of insult or or ridicule connotation that it does now, but they were saying that Peter and John are uneducated idiots. They are not qualified to do what they are doing, yet here they are doing it. And I read that, and I'm thinking, have you ever felt unqualified? Untalented, unprepared, uncertain, unattractive, under-resourced, unequipped, unworthy? Have you ever felt unworthy? I'll tell you, friends, every time I walk up here, I feel unworthy. I have to remind myself, I'm not worthy. Jesus makes me worthy. But I think everyone, at some point, will have that moment where they're just like, you know what, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm unequipped, I'm unprepared, I'm unenlightened, whatever it is. And it's easy when you're feeling that to just think, you know what, maybe I'm not qualified. But the truth is, and it was true for Peter and John, the truth is, they were uneducated and ordinary. Uh, The truth is, maybe you're not that talented. Maybe you're not that inspiring or experienced or resourced or prepared. Maybe you're not that equipped or that compelling. Like, Like, that's the truth. Maybe you're not. But guess where we find that confidence to go as we're commanded? We don't qualify ourselves. It's Jesus who qualifies us. It's Jesus who calls us and equips us. And that's what we're going to see as we study through the book of Acts. He loves to take people who are unqualified, again, transform them, and then unleash them for his purposes. So in Acts chapter 3 and 4, Uh, Here's the story. It starts with compassion, tremendous compassion. These two ordinary, unschooled guys show extraordinary compassion. So in Acts 3, Peter and John are heading to the church, heading to temple, and outside the temple is a beggar asking people for money as they come in. Uh, In Acts chapter 3, verse 2, Now a man who was lame from birth, 
So he had been crippled his whole life, uh, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day. Every day, this is where he is. This is where he existed. He sat outside the temple gate, and he begged the people who were going into the church to give him some money. He's been doing that his entire life. And when Peter and John walk by, he calls out to them and asks for help. Verse 4 says, Peter looks straight at him, as did John. They look straight at him. And the language here is that there was kind of a, a glare, not a, a harsh or a, a critical glare, but a very intentional stare. They see him. And I've got to think that for that beggar, it was not something that was normally practiced. Most people would walk by him every day, and if they looked at him, they certainly don't see him. And here's what's interesting. It says that beggar had been there every day. Peter and John and Jesus, by the way, must have walked by him before. <laughs> this wasn't the first time they had probably noticed him, but this is the time they stop and they look at him. And it's just the right time. It's the right time to speak and to do something for him. So Peter and John, they look at him and they show compassion. And friends, when followers of Jesus show extraordinary compassion, it just unleashes the church. It, it makes room for the gospel. Verse 6, Peter says, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And the guy gets up. And he starts walking around and he creates this huge stir because he's been sitting there every day crippled, begging for money. And now he's walking around, and not only walking around, but praising the Lord. And then people begin to gather around to listen to what Peter and John have to say about this Jesus. So here's what I want you to catch. Their act of compassion gives them credibility and creates an opportunity. Their act of compassion gives credibility to the gospel, and it creates an opportunity to connect people to Jesus. This is what we're going to be about here in 2023. That we want to go out of our way to love people. Because every act of Radical compassion gives credibility to the gospel and it creates an opportunity to connect people to Jesus. That's what was true for Peter and John. It wasn't their education, it wasn't their qualifications, it was their compassion that unleashed the gospel. In Acts chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Many who heard the message believed, and so the number of men who believed grew to be about 5,000. <coughs> Now Peter is preaching. So it's an act of compassion followed by words, courageous words. There's a connection between compassion and speaking with courage. Notice, notice the order. Peter had the credibility to speak with courage because first he had demonstrated that compassion. And what happens next uh, had to be pretty scary for them if you look at Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says, The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. And keep in mind, these are the same people who are responsible for the trials that would sentence Jesus to death. Not the same group of people, but these same people. And it says, They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they, they seized them. They arrested Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. Now Peter and John knew that they might be killed for speaking about Jesus. It's not the same as when you guys tell me, well, I'd like to be on the evangelism team, but I'm not good at talking to people, right? They could be killed for speaking about Jesus, but it didn't stop them. <clears throat> Chapter 4, verse 7 says, They brought in the two disciples and demanded, By what power or in whose name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, Are we 
he says, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Really? Like, like that's what you're coming at me with? We, we helped somebody and you're going to try to make us look bad because we helped somebody? Um, that's pretty hard to do, isn't it? Make somebody look bad uh, while they're helping someone. Um, make somebody look bad when they're performing an act of compassion, right? You're out in the snowstorm last week and you see a car in the ditch and you drive by and, and there's Chuck pulling somebody out of the ditch and you drive by and say, boy, that Chuck is a rotten guy. Doesn't work. It's difficult to make somebody look like an enemy when they are performing acts of compassion. And Peter's like, is that really what we're doing here? And then Peter and John, they, they say, do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Oh, he said the name. He put it out there, and just in case there was any confusion on it, he says, do you want to know what Jesus Christ, which Jesus I'm talking about? That would be the one that you crucified and God raised from the dead, that Jesus. That's who we're talking about. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. So what we see about Peter and John is they spend time with Jesus and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And as a result, um, in verse 13, chapter 4, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled and ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. This is why Jesus loves to unleash the unqualified. Because what gets noticed is not that they're super talented, not that they're fun to be around, not that they're a great speaker, whatever it is, what gets noticed is that they spent time with him, with Jesus. The way we can say it, unleashing the full force of the church happens when ordinary people spend time with Jesus. I'd like to encourage you over the next few weeks to explore some of the ways we might live that out. I want you to say, you know what, okay, I'm not just going to attend, I'm going to engage. I'm not just going to watch, I'm going to be a part of the church. I'm going to spend time with Jesus, I'm going to do his work, I'm going to trust Jesus to guide me and fuel me with his compassion and his courage, and then he's going to set me free to advance the gospel. That's what I want you to tell me. Come to me and say, you know what, I want to join a Bible study. Come to me and say, you know what? I want to lead a Bible study. I can see some of you do this when I say that. <laughs> I want to start a small group. I want to start a new mission. I have a great idea about how we can help people in this church, in this community, in our world, whatever it is. And I, I could get all revved up about it, friends, because I want to do all kinds of things with you. I want to be in this mission with you. We've got so many opportunities to live this out. But I know some of you are thinking, like I said, I can see you kind of like, oh, don't look at me, right? Maybe you're thinking, I don't know if that's for me. I'm too old, I'm too young. I'm not educated, like I don't know a lot about the Bible. I'm, I'm not a leader, I've heard that a time or two. I'm not a people person. I don't have experience, I haven't done that before. I'm not equipped. I'm unqualified. None of that is true. None of that is true because of Jesus. Jesus makes us that way, equipped, qualified, compassionate, courageous. And you know, there's one other word that I'm going to throw out there that really keeps us bridled, that keeps us leashed. That word is unavailable, right? You might not use that exact word and say, I'm unavailable. 
Um, but it shows up in all sorts of ways. I don't have time for that right now. I'm just so busy. It's not my thing, right? You've heard that before? That's just not my thing. Um, I think somebody else would be better at that. And it's amazing, if you study through Scripture, what God does through ordinary people, if they are available. The one thing, though, that keeps us leashed up is that we just, we say no. We say not right now. We say maybe when things get back to normal a little bit for me, maybe when things ease up at work, maybe when I get my life together, maybe when I get some things cleaned up, maybe, maybe, maybe. It's being unavailable that keeps us leashed. So my challenge for you is to lose the leash. I want to see unbridled faith. Let's come together and be united in whatever God has in store for us. And my prayer is that God would just unleash the full force of this church to love people in radical ways. The power of the church happens when we all come together to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Friends, let's pray. Jesus, I know that you have called each of your followers to be part of this mission. And I pray, God, that you would help us as we begin this new year to say to you, I am available. That that would be our commitment. We'd make ourselves available to you to accomplish whatever you want to do in us and through us. It is in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Would you open your hymnals uh, to number 704, and we'll join in singing together, uh, God Will Make a Way, and we're going to go on to 705, It Is Well With My Soul, uh, verses 1, 3, and 4. Um, you can sit or stand, however you are most comfortable, friends, just don't forget to sing, right? Let's, let's join together in singing our praises to God. <clears throat>
a time of prayers of the people. I'll ask if you have any joys or concerns that you would like to lift up to the Lord in prayer this morning. Um, I do want to clarify, just so I don't have anyone ask me this week. Uh, yes, I tossed out some names as sermon illustrations today. Uh, Kate does not have unbridled spending habits. Uh, I think it's quite the opposite, actually. Um, Tim is a hard worker, though, and Chuck is not a bad guy. So if I owe any of you a dollar for using your name today, you let me know. But um, thank you for playing along. I appreciate that. I like to keep you engaged in that way. So. Uh, do we have joys or concerns that we might lift up this morning? We've mentioned that Shelley's daughter is, is traveling, also that Carl and Sally have an anniversary, 68 years, to uh, lift up and, and offer praise and also prayer. Um, any others this morning? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving God, listen to your children praying, hear us, our conversations, our thoughts, our petitions, our prayers. We're so thankful, God, that you've gathered us together in this time, in this place, in your presence, to worship you to learn about you, to be in fellowship with one another, to become more and more equipped through your spirit, Lord, to unleash your power through this church. We thank you, Lord, for the many, many blessings you have bestowed upon us, those times of celebration in our lives, whether it's a special anniversary or, or even just something throughout the day that, that makes us smile, that makes us laugh, that makes us so thankful. Lord, for, for all that we have uh, experienced, all that we have going on around us. And Lord, we also come before you to lay our burdens at your feet, those things that cause us uh, concern in our lives, those times of tribulation, and those who are perhaps fighting a, an illness of some sort, whether it's physical in nature or mental in nature, uh, emotional or spiritual. Um, there are so many things that come up, Lord, uh, whether it's at school or at work or in our relationships or just in our, our world um, that give us pause, that make us feel perhaps uh, insecure, uh, afraid, um, un uncertain. And we ask that you would just wrap your arms around us, that you would encompass us with your love and with your peace uh, so that we can indeed have that sense of calm and stillness in our, in our souls, in our hearts, so that each and every day uh, we can stop and know you and understand that you are in control. And God, we give you thanks for that. Uh, continue to guide us, lead us. Uh, continue to heal us, equip us, and empower us. We trust you to show us the way on the path that you have chosen for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Humbly to the earth you came, born into this world to save. God with us, Emmanuel, now we adore your name, your name. to dismiss this morning, I want to share just a brief uh, devotional with you. This appeared in Guidepost magazine a couple years ago, and I think it fits right in with, with where we're going. Uh, the, the focus scripture coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, 
do all to the glory of God. And it says, theologians will tell you that the glory of God is the manifestation of his being, nature, person, and character. Okay, you say, but what does this mean? In your personal life, do you strive to glorify God? And is there more to it than simply saying, praise the Lord as you walk down the hall? Is it different now than it was in Bible times? What does it mean to glorify God in the 21st century? Let's not complicate things. You glorify God when you make him look good. It's just that simple. And how do you make him look good? By how you live, by how you treat your family, your friends, a stranger, by honesty and integrity. Jesus told the disciples that they were the light of the world. But in reality, there's no light in the heart of anyone until Jesus makes that heart his home. Then his light within you makes you different. And it's a difference that the world notices. So do you want to make God look good? There are two ways you can do that, by what you say and by how you live. One is your verbal witness, the second is your visual witness. Of course, he inhabits the praises of his people and wants to receive that praise, honor, and glory, but you also glorify God by your life. Making God look good is what bringing glory to him is all about. Friends, I want you to create an opportunity to advance that gospel. Will you look for that uh, in the days to come and uh, in this new year? As you leave this place today, may our Lord bless you, keep you, make his face to shine upon you, and surround you with his love now and forever. Amen. Let's stand and join in our closing hymn, Lord Be Glorified. It's number 2150 in the faith we sing. Uh, and that first verse, uh, we're going to sing, In My Life, Lord, instead of Our Lives, In My Life. Uh, and then the other verses, I believe, are printed below. So let's join in together. Thank you.